these chapters were like a nice break from all of like the emotional stuff <laughs> of the past two and was purely more just like action um yes. i just kept picturing how funny it would be to see man eating cheap <laughs> And, like, maybe this is just me being very Midwestern, but we have sheep. Like, this is, like, probably the most, like, Wisconsin story I could ever tell. Um, but w the town that I lived in when I was really young was very small to the point that we didn't even have, like, a population on our sign. It said unincorporated, which means that, like, less than 500 people live in, like, the actual town. Um, like our our downtown was a gas station and a, like a pizza place and like a bar, two okay. bars because it's Wisconsin and that that it took five minutes like not even to drive through it, but anyway, my first grade teacher, <laughs> we went on a field trip to her house, that was and to show because she had a sheep farm, at her house that was like five minutes from the school, <laughs> and that's like something that we did and so ever since then I've loved sheep. And so when I have heard this story, I was like, that's adorable that these sheep want to murder you, though. <laughs> and it was just like a funny image to imagine these like two demigods that have like battled Ares, the god of war, just standing there being like, we can't get the golden fleece because sheep are going to eat us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't. Uh, so I actually forgot to look up where the man eating sheep came from, but I feel like I want to say it might have been in the myth with um, Cupid and Psyche that like mm -hmm. one of her tasks was to get police from sheep that would eat her or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder why there was this idea of it because I do know broadly that does sound like it's something from Greek myth. Um, like, do they just seem mindless enough that you'd be scared enough that if you were there, they would just eat you? I don't know. Like. And they're so, I think the thing is that they're so, like, unassuming. You just think that they're, like, just chilling. And then they, like, eat something to the point that their bones are the only thing that are left. And you're like, okay. <laughs> like, yes, that's not going to work. And it makes you wonder, like, how many um, satyrs or other things like that died that way. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> like, geez. Yeah, so... We find out immediately that was the trap that Polyphemus has on his island, is those sheep. And mm -hmm. um, he loves those sheep very much. He has names for them. He speaks to them. That is also in, that's actually in his characterization in Homer. I'm pretty sure he's talking to the sheep. Um, not the naming them. They didn't actually have names. But um, I love that Rick gave them to him because it does seem like if you're with these sheep long enough, it would happen. Yeah, uh, I would I would give them names, even if they wanted to kill me, I would still be like, I will name you Fred or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, so Annabeth goes right by the playbook when it comes to Polyphemus, and it it actually serves her better than it did Odysseus, which I mean all of the hubris that Odysseus eventually got thwarted by only came from Clarice. So I, I kind of, um, I think she would have been more successful overall had Clarice been a little bit more chill. Oh my, one of my favorite lines that I like immediately pictured Leah saying, and I was like, that's going to be one of those lines that people post videos of a lot because it's just funny, is when Clarice is just like yelling about how about how Grover is a satyr and ruining their whole thing and like being the most tone deaf, like if, if an autistic person me is reading that and being like, can you pick up on some social cues, you know, you know, that it's really bad. And it was really like, how, how like, ridiculous can you possibly be to not pick any of that up. But when she stops and is like, she needs to shut up. <laughs> I was like, I could picture her saying that and how funny that is going to be of her being like you need to stop talking yeah so um the context it, for like people that are watching is in these chapters they get to polyphemus's island and clarice has already pulled up there but she is held captive by polyphemus he has her over a boiling pot of water and he's about to cook her for like his wedding feast to grover and she blows Grover's cover. Like, she just, 
starts saying, no, that's a satyr. And it's like, what do you, what do you mean? That's your wife. That's a satyr. His name's Grover. He's, I know him. And like Polythemus even like gets confused and it's like, oh, you must be confused. Like young little child. And she's like, no, I'm definitely correct that that is a satyr and that you don't know what you're talking about. And it was just like, oh my God, you are definitely an Aries child <laughs> with a how like, how you're just like barreling forward and not like thinking about like, can you just pretend like you don't know what you're talking about for 10 seconds? No? Okay then. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And it was like, oh my gosh, Clarice, like what, what is this? What purpose is this serving right now? Other than to get Grover killed too? Like, yeah. And one thing, I, one thing I like with Clarice with this part, it was funny imagining Dior play this stuff of just being like, so so like obstinate i suppose is like the best way to put it of being like no i'm not gonna be okay with this with this monster thinking that i'm wrong about something to the point that i will like put th this person in danger with me um but it was also i like that because i like that clarice is not like immediately like redeemed or something like that or whatever like we talked about this when we compared this stuff to harry potter with like draco and other people like that that there's like usually with villains they're either like a horrible villain or they are like almost like wolfified or like the good version of that would be like zuko that actually goes through the whole thing of like you know practicing apologizing to people which is also one of the most autistic shit i've ever seen in my fucking life is that scene of zuko when he's practicing apologizing to like the gang and and then it cuts to like whatever animal he's practicing on it with. And he's like, I can't do, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's us just with normal conversations. I'm like, there has to be people who think that he's autistic or something yes. in, in that fandom. <laughs> they're, they're, they have to, but either way, like there's usually just one or the other. And so I appreciate that right a little bit before this is when they see that, you know, Aries is threatening to hit her and everything before the boat blows up. And that he like screwed her over with the boat in the first place, which is why he blew up in all together in the beginning anyway. But that they're not like immediately friends. They're not like getting along. They still don't really like each other. It's mm -hmm. just that she's not evil or anything, but they still don't really get along either. And she's just kind of annoyed by all of them because she just wants to be an Aries kid and wants all of the like wants all of the glory and wants to win so bad. Mm -hmm. that she is arguing with the people that are trying to rescue her. <laughs> yeah, it's like, have you ever stopped to think, like, had you not blown Grover's cover, he could have find a way to get you out of the situation? Yes, like, the thing that happens after that, of course, is that, um, that Polythemus puts them in that cave and puts that giant, like, stone brick whatever thing in front of the cave that they can't move and they can't get, like, get through it and i forget how they get through it annabeth when she's or so annabeth does the it's how they get out of the cave in the odyssey so she puts percy below one of his sheep and as he's going into the cave that's how right, and right. it's and she, and she, wearing her cap yeah and she puts her so she, they just go in when he goes in but yes. it's like if you didn't do that you wouldn't have had to spend like an entire day basically trapped in a cave with Grover being hung upside down, I'm pretty sure still when you're in there. <laughs> um, I think that it's just one of those funny things with Aries being her dad, that it's like, you can't, you just can't help but like be like, I need to win. Yeah. And it's like, do you know how to shut up sometimes though? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm like already picturing, like it's funny to imagine Dior acting this stuff out because Dior is one of the older, like, mm -hmm people like she is 18 i think and so she's you know three years older than um walker and leah and so it's just funny to imagine somebody like age wise older than them and but she is the one that's the problem <laughs> they're the ones that have it together and have like a clear plan happening here and she's just like bulldozing the plan because she just won't shut up <laughs> yeah. well so polyphemus is a perfect enemy for that kind of thing to happen for those kinds of blunders because 
with that big stone door, if you kill him, how are you getting out? It's like all of them combined could not move that stone. No. So um, when Annabeth sneaks them in that way, that's what I found like surprising was part of the interaction is Annabeth decides to distract Polyphemus while Percy goes to free Grover and Clarice. And she pulls the nobody stunt. She's like, hey, it's nobody with her cap of invisibility. Mm -hmm. And um, he throws the door at her and it shatters. So she's automatically doing better than Odysseus because there's no way for him to put the door back now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think where her plan kind of failed is that we find out that Polyphemus has like a blurry milky eye, but he can see out of it a little bit better. Like it's healed some since Odysseus gouged it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so we have to imagine that because his sight has been bad for so long, his sense of hearing has gotten better. And even though she's wearing the cap of invisibility as like a double protection of he can't see her normally, plus she's invisible, he can hear her and he can probably hear her pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much what happens is he hears her enough to pull, to like pick her up even though she's still invisible. And then it doesn't matter that she has it on anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. One part, oh, one thing from that convention that Walker did that I forgot about is the other thing he said is that Aryan's wedding dress looks great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's still in the wedding dress for this scene. <laughs> uh -huh. And so the thing from this scene that I also really liked is Grover running like running up to Percy, giving him a big hug and be like, oh my god, you got my message. That actually worked because he didn't really have a way to know if if like he actually got, if it actually worked, if anything happened there that was, was supposed to. So I could like literally picture Aryan and Walker playing that like part because of how well they he depicts Grover in the show. It just I could like literally hear him saying that because it's because he does such a good job with that role, um, and picturing that happen of like like sidebar to like literally everything else that is going on. I'm so glad that you actually got my message, yeah. and that we were able to do all of that stuff. Yeah, and so um, it's just, it's funny to imagine him in the dress. I mean, I think he has it off by the time that they decide. Um, so Annabeth gets knocked out and Polyphemus has her in his hands. And so that's when um, Percy decides he's going to act. He's going to act whether or not Grover and Clarice come with him, but they decide to come with him. And I thought it was interesting, Clarice somehow managed to scrounge up a spear. Like, where did you just happen to find a spear? And poor Grover is stuck with a sheep, um, a sheep bone that he feels ambivalent about. Yeah, he's like, okay, I guess I'll use this. The, yeah. the part with that with Percy that I liked is how he is like, it shows his default is obviously to just like sacrifice himself, but he doesn't actually want to do that. And I'm like, yeah, that's what happens when you get beat up as a kid <laughs> is you just like assume like, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. Right. But I liked how literally you're in his head of him being like, oh, I'm glad that other people are helping me because I didn't actually want to have to fight a Cyclops by myself. Yeah. Um, but that's literally how that well, how that thinking goes. It's like, well, I was beat up a lot by my stepdad growing up. So this is what I'm I'm just supposed to sacrifice myself. Right. And they're like, no, it's like, oh. This will be much better with you guys. Thanks for not, like, making me be the only one to do this. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I looked up a little bit and I couldn't find anything was um, they do attack plan Macedonia. And, <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, what, what did this come from? Um, when you look up Macedonian battle tactics, just a bunch of stuff on the phalanx and not a lot else but this is like some sort of wedge formation where you know they're surrounding them which probably works better than a phalanx because a phalanx isn't great for uneven terrain this one it doesn't matter what terrain you're on um and uh yeah so percy goes from the front he has grover and clarice go in from the sides and the point of this whole interaction seems to be let's just distract him enough that he drops Annabeth. 
of course, not realizing that dropping Annabeth is only going to hurt her worse, but yeah. yeah. What can they do? And exactly. my favorite line of Percy's where I'm like, Rick Riordan, you are being like on the nose with like Percy's characterization, but also it like fits for the scene where he says like, I'm nobody and I'm proud of it. And I'm like, yeah, that's what Percy thinks about himself anyway, but he can get away with actually having him say that. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> but it was fun to like picture them all trying to like, he's basically just like an angry bull that they're just trying to like move back and forth. Like I was just picturing in my head of him like running into a wall here and then turning around and running the other way and just, that's the only way to, I guess the thing that that like helps you understand is like how hard it is to kill a Cyclops. Um, it's like weird good foreshadowing for when Tyson shows up in a couple minutes after this, mm -hmm. that it just shows how difficult it actually is to hurt them. Like none of their plans that they try really were about killing him necessarily. It was more about just trying to get away from him long enough to to like leave him on this island yeah it, the plan is get annabeth and go and it's yeah they don't really care about defeating polyphemia i guess clarice does a little bit but nobody else does mm -hmm. yeah, yeah Clarice just wants to like dominate of course but the rest of them are just like can we just get the hell out of here <laughs> yeah so um was it Grover that runs off with Annabeth first? I, and then, like, he also mentions Clarice runs with Annabeth at some point. And we've seen on Dior's um, Instagram that she's bulking up. So I wonder if they're actually going to make her, like, you know, carry um, Leah. Yeah, carry Leah. Yeah. That was, it's funny. They're, someone is going to have to, which is just funny to imagine them doing that. But they're going to have to do it because she's bleeding so much, like, this is kind of a big thing, I guess, for them is it's the first time that one of them has been like seriously hurt mm -hmm. um, where they can't like just like the times it sounds ridiculous saying that considering that in the first book, Percy gets poisoned, but he also gets healed by it. And so that like stops before it gets to a certain point. But this is just them being like hurt, like her head is bleeding a lot. That's not like a magical thing that's happening to her. And so they have to, and they can't, even though they use like the golden fleece to heal her, it's still like not a, like a magical, like she's immediately fine the way that it was with Percy yeah. in the first book slash the first season, like she's still out of it. Um, and they're still having to carry her around <laughs> when like it ends, when they're trying to get onto the boat without Poethemus killing them. <laughs> Yeah, so um, their struggle eventually gets to a point where we think that Polyphemus is going to eat Percy and that's when Tyson appears again. And I thought it was just like really funny. It throws a rock in Polyphemus's mouth to choke him out as he's about to take a bite of Percy. It was like the perfect timing. And what I love about that happening was Percy's, Percy had just had this internal conflict of I know Polyphemus is technically my brother and he's also a Cyclops and I love Tyson and I would never hurt Tyson so I can't hurt this brother, right? But then Tyson's like, yes, you can, bitch. Like, I'm here. <laughs> I, I love that part because that is just Percy as a character, which is why most people love him so much, is that he has that never-ending, like, empathy, which is actually... This is like one of those salt boxes I get on. Like most people talk about abused people as if we're going to turn into abusers mm -hmm. um, because that's for whatever reason, that's like the storyline that a lot of like media uses is if you're abused, they introduce that so that you will like be the villain <laughs> or something, you know, like there's, there's little things like that that are like, not like that. Like you can think of Harry Potter, like Harry is abused, but they basically ignore the fact that he is and like Draco obviously has a horrendous home life you like you meet his dad and there is a little bit of that but that's so much of a storyline that they act like if you're abused then you're going to be like a bad person and it's like no actually most of the time we end up being really good people we end up being like the super empathetic people that will see a cyclops that is trying to kill us 
and it's like but i don't i don't want to kill it because like i don't want to just kill it like that that's just not what i want to do because i still have empathy for it as like a creature like yes we're here and we need the golden fleece but it's not like we've necessarily done like it hasn't necessarily done anything to us is doing this stuff to us because we're trying to take something that it has and so it's almost like he understands why it's like upset at them and it's like i don't want to hurt i don't want to hurt this thing and it's one of those things that i love about this like world that being empathetic towards other things is rewarded or it's seen as like that's what you're supposed to be doing because like the whole reason why tyson survives is because he's nice to rainbow is yeah. because rainbow follows him and is able to save him from being underwater when everything blows up and so like the fact because he was nice and sweet to like another creature he ends up surviving otherwise he wouldn't have and so it's one of those things that even though all these things happen after that moment because of Percy not just killing Polythemus, that's also just like not Percy. Like that's not him. He's not like the he'll kill things if he has to, but that's not what he wants to do. And so it was nice to see them make that point again in this situation of no, but I have empathy for all these different creatures. And I know that it's not necessarily bad just because it's a Cyclops, right? And then Tyson is like, actually, some Cyclops do suck. Yeah. Like, sometimes they just lie. Um, but that's honestly the best way to make like that point of like, you have to actually talk to each individual one to find out how they feel and not just like assume that all of them are bad. Mm -hmm. um, that good job. <laughs> like yeah. that's, that's how that stuff should go. Well, and I've only ever had one teacher to teach me the Odyssey in a way that was meant to make me empathetic towards Polythemus, because what happened was Odysseus and 12 men just helped themselves to his food. They just find his cave, they go in, they, they serve themselves, they sacrifice some of his animals even to, um, you know, have a traditional feast. Mm -hmm. And so of course when he comes in he's like who the hell are you guys and the this is even how it's described in homer he, he bashes two of them on the head like puppies i don't know why like puppies what what did homer have against puppies why are you hitting puppies <laughs> yeah um uh, but he like bashes them on the head and then eats them and it's you know you're a lot of people will focus on the brutality of that but it's like they were rude guests they they yes. went into his house and just helped themselves yeah like in this story like when they show up on the island like percy is thinking about like we're gonna have to take the golden fleece from this island and this island might like he asked annabeth like what's gonna happen to the island after we take this thing like is it gonna die and she's like no it'll like it'll go back to how it was before but it'll be fine it just like won't have all of this like wildlife and growth like it has right now and he feels a little bad about it because he's like you know it's not this island's fault and the animals that are on here that we need this thing but we but either way it's like but everyone at camp is gonna die if we don't bring this back so we have to take it but it's like the whole thing of thinking about that stuff like i could never imagine anyone at least these kids in this world to show up at some at like a place like this and just start eating everyone's food and then act like they're the victim when like that the thing that they're stealing all their food from gets upset with them like like what are you doing why are you just stealing food from them in the first place do you know that makes people upset when you steal from from people even and monsters as well yeah that would make them upset <laughs> yeah well and it was this assumption that the cyclopes operate under the same moral code of ethics that the Greeks do because there was this guest host culture thing in Greek mythology, Xenia, where if you went to somebody's house, you were expected to do that. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have that same understanding. They didn't have fear of the gods. And the way that the Cyclopes are described almost reminds me of reading like early Europeans ethnographies of indigenous people mm -hmm. where it's like, oh yeah, they don't cultivate the land. They don't have religion. They don't have laws. 
but maybe they do, they just don't understand the methods, you know? That's exactly what that stuff reminds me of, which is why I'm glad that these books like question that stuff. Like these kids don't show up and just like steal things mm -hmm. from, even from monsters. They like sometimes have to find food when they literally don't have any, but they don't like do that and like expect that that's okay because that's no longer, it shouldn't anyway be a way that people think that you can just take whatever you want and just assume that they don't know what you're doing. Like, even with Polyphemus, they're like actually talking to him. <laughs> and yeah. like, yeah, they're, they're talking to him to try to get him to fall into one of their traps. But like the, the plan, I was gonna say like the plan that Percy came up with, like just like knocking the fence over and having him fall into like a big, the big like hole or whatever so that, and so that they have time to leave is a smart plan it just didn't work because he got across the the bridge too fast so it's like even a cyclops that's not supposed to be like that is like kind of stupid is still smart enough to figure out what their plan is and find a way around it and so they're not even with the monsters that they run into they're not like talking down to them they're not talking about them as if they are so much superior beings which is actually that was one point that i wanted to make with this, with Percy not wanting to kill a Cyclops and all that kind of stuff, and it going in line with like Tyson coming back and saving them, like he's the only reason that they get the Golden Fleece. He is able to get it because the man-eating sheep think that he, he he's giving them food because he's a Cyclops. If he wasn't there, I don't, I don't even know how they would have gotten it. It would have been, it would have been really hard if they would have even been able to get it. And so he like saves them because, and the whole reason that works is because Percy is treating him like he's an equal. Um, I wanted to bring that up because a friend of mine sent me like a part of the scene in The Lightning Thief when Luke reveals his whole plan and, and tries to kill Percy. And I didn't, I didn't read those chapters when we did those for this, but there's a part in there where, hold on. Let me see if I can get it on but, um, back to the caves. What he says is that when What's-His-Face takes over, when Kronos takes over, what he says is that when What's-His-Face takes over, when Kronos takes over, that he's going to, that all of the humans are going to go back to the caves. Mm -hmm. And the only ones that will survive are the ones that are strong enough to, like, join him. And I'm like, that's eugenics. That's literally eugenics. <laughs> Like, that's what, that's what Luke is saying there. And so that like makes sense for Luke because he has a sword that can kill human beings. Why do you have that? Why do you have a sword that can kill human beings? He has that. So he obviously feels like he is better than other people, which is why I'm pretty sure that those humans on his ship are literally food and that he's just waiting to feed them to the monsters on the ship whenever they're hungry, because he obviously has no like, belief of anything at all like that human beings matter at all he sees himself as above them as like better than them and that if you don't join him it's because you're like less than and lower and that you need to like go back to living in caves because you're just like not like smart enough or i don't know the right word but it's such it's pure eugenics like that's literally like eugenics and if you don't know what eugenics is is the idea that like that um you have to, that like the idea that like people who are disabled or people who are even people of color should not like have babies because you want like a superior gene set like you hear rich people like elon musk say this like they literally like elon musk has literally said this that he wants to have as many kids as possible because he thinks that he's so smart that if he has a bunch of kids he can like fix the human race by his kids being smart he's autistic he's disabled and he's saying that shit. it doesn't matter if you're disabled like luke probably has adhd and dyslexia because he's a demigod but he's still being part of eugenics and that there's so much eugenicist shit in our society in general like the whole idea that like during covid that if you had like pre-existing conditions you're just supposed to like suck it up and possibly die if you leave the house and it's still like that now that's a very like eugenics eugenics idea and so i like these books having luke as being the villain 
of being like, I think that I'm better than everyone. I don't care about anybody. And if anyone doesn't agree with me, I think that they're lesser than me and I'm, and I'm above them and that I'm just going to wipe them out and restart society with like the good people, because I think anyone who agrees with me is like the, the good, smart people versus somebody like Percy that has guilt about killing a monster that is trying to kill him and his friend. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's, I like that juxtaposition between those two ways of thinking very much so thank thank you for doing that because when you have characters in a book like this that is that they're all disabled especially a character like tyson that ends up saving everybody multiple times in this one book alone mm -hmm. i feel like you kind of have to make that point because there's so many eugenics shit that you run into when you're when you're disabled like i'm pretty sure that the reason why i haven't been able to find a job is because i'm disabled <laughs> yeah and it would and it's hard like i i told you about like a family member of mine extended family member of mine was like well why don't you just get a job at like target or something like acting like it was a really easy thing and it was like those jobs aren't even around anyway but even if they were around i don't think that i could actually do that job yeah. without like going to the bathroom many times a day to like cry <laughs> because of being like overstimulated and scared about having to talk to people like both disabilities like on top of each other and so it's it's hard to like kind of try to get through the world when you are disabled when people are just telling you basically stop being like that mm -hmm. and so one of the things i've always liked about this series is that everyone is disabled and that you're not and that you're looked down on if you think if you talk badly to them because they are yeah and i love that percy doesn't let anybody else do it to tyson for him like mm -hmm. percy treats him like an equal and it sets the tone for everybody and if anybody messes with that he is the big brother ready to stand up for his little brother yeah every once every once in a while i'll see a, like a TikTok video of somebody doing like skits or whatever and it'll be like will is one of the apollo kids who's the ones that like are the ones that heal everybody because of Apollo being in charge of like medicine and everything. Mm -hmm. And everyone's while I'll see a video like that of one of them acting out a skit of them being like tired because somebody was mean, a, a bunch of kids were being mean to Tyson. So Percy beat all of them up and now they have to like fix all of them <laughs> and being like Percy. And he's like, I don't regret it. <laughs> and he, he wouldn't absolutely not. Um, oh, that's also a part from this is that he Percy is like losing to Polythemus and then he starts thinking about how if he loses that all of his friends are going to die too. And he, that's how he's able to even get him in the position where he could possibly kill him. And they're like, whoa, <laughs> like I remember like Grover, I think is like, whoa, like Percy, how did you do that? And it's like from rage. Yep. And like needing to protect the people that you love. Yeah, that's where that rage comes from. And it, that's the only place that that rage really comes from, really, when it comes to him anyway. But it's just yeah. that whole idea. I love when stories use that kind of rage to like just have people go full beast mode. The other one that comes to mind is Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah. yeah, because Link was fully out of commission. Zelda's just like, Oh, okay. All of a sudden, I know how to use my ceiling powers. Yeah. Yeah. I always love when they do that, especially when it's something like that, like when you need to protect the people that you love and you're like, no. And especially because that is how I literally feel like going through life is I will like say nothing if somebody's being mean to me. But if they're being mean to somebody that I'm that I like, even just like, not even like a if you're like a close friend i'll fucking kill you <laughs> like I'll, I'll like murder you in your sleep <laughs> don't test me like i remember times when i was in like high school that kids at my high school would make fun of um my best friend at the time because he was gay but it was like the early 2000s and yeah, we yeah. lived in a very conservative small town it was in no way safe for anyone to come out there it's not even safe for people to come out there now much less back then um so kids used to like make fun of him in the hallway about being gay as like a like something to make fun of him for and i was like a very silent person in high school like i did not talk unless i was around people that i actually knew otherwise i did not really say anything 
Um, and they would say stuff about him and I would hear them and just start screaming at them in the middle of the hallway. And they would be like, <laughs> like they would literally be looking at me like that. Like, Oh my God, <laughs> be like, don't fuck with me. Or there was <laughs> the story that, that I look back at that is like funny is this one kid was bothering my sister on the bus and he was like taking like pens out of her backpack and like trying to like break them in half. And I turned around and grabbed his shirt and was like, don't touch her stuff ever again. And he like dropped them on the floor and was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And like Cassie was like, oh my God, that was so cool. And like, and the same thing though, I never like talked. And then all of a sudden I, I turn around to like grab him and be like, stay away from my sister. And we got home from school that day and my, my sister runs in and is like, oh my God, mom, Shannon did the coolest thing ever. And my mom was like, at first, like not happy with me that I did that. But the kid who did that to her ended up being a very bad person, like hurt somebody else at our school very badly. And so my mom after that was like, never mind. <laughs> like, good job, daughter. I'm really glad that you like beat him up. But literally, that's how it is. And so <laughs> that's how our friendship was created. Yes. <laughs> somebody was mean to you, and I was like, die. <laughs> But that's that's why I like I I understand Percy so much. So I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of what you do. When you have like shitty family or whatever, you find people that like you for you. Mm -hmm. That's what you're like, I'll kill you. Don't that's like the one time that he'll actually kill somebody. Yeah, and I mean Tex is like the one friend that he's had that whole year of being that just really liked him, you know? And it wasn't about him being a hero. It wasn't about any of his accomplishments. It wasn't about being a son of Poseidon, even though they had that in common and didn't know it. Like, so their relationship is just pure on a different level. Yeah, it's just pure, like, love in that way. Like, just a nice, like, connection that has nothing to do with anything else. Just purely just because they care about each other. Um, I, like, it's fun to imagine, like, Grover seeing... Tyson for the first time because he misses all of that stuff mm -hmm. and it, because I feel like Grover and Tyson would get along yeah <laughs> Grover would probably want to adopt him too yeah Grover it would take him just a couple seconds to be like oh wait this is a nice Cyclops okay we're good <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and especially because his introduction to Tyson is literally Tyson throwing that rock so yeah, no doubts that he's a good Cyclops from the very beginning for, for Grover. And it's nice for them to recognize, like, hey, yeah, there are nice Cyclopses out there. Mm -hmm. This one is, like, mean, but it's also mad because a human gouged his eye out. Yeah. So, like, even this one has, like, an actual reason for why they hate human beings. Mm -hmm. It was cool, too. I liked how they used the Golden Fleece because it was cool to see them do use it like that to try to cure Annabeth, even if it didn't work, like, all the way. Yeah. It's just a cool to see, like, how powerful it really is, like, imagining something that could do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, like, we obviously know how powerful it is because it brings a dead person back to life, but it's still cool to see it, it used, like, that. I, I don't think of Talia as being dead. I don't know if that's just me. Maybe it's because like trees are, you know, plants are still technically living. I see it more as just a transmutation than a death. Dude, one of, one of the most confusing things mm -hmm. in Percy Jackson, you will never get an answer to it, but you will absolutely spend a ridiculous amount of time trying to figure out what it is is which one of the big three kids is oldest because there is percy that is like in his chronological age there is thalia who is technically older than him but she was a tree for six years for a while and then came back to life as a 15 year old is now just eternally a 15 year old and then there's nico that was born in the 1930s but was in like the lotus casino the whole time so chronologically he's like 10 or 12 or whatever but he's actually like 80 years old mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't know. like i think about that sometimes and i'm just like yeah they really made that confusing, confusing. <laughs> and there's hazel in like the later books is the same kind of thing 
where she like comes back after being like not alive but alive but not alive for a long time and it's just like what the hell like that's beyond confusing to try to figure out um so i don't even know how to describe like it's weird because you wonder like how much thalia picks if she picks up on anything that's going on mm -hmm. it's like that dream that that percy had where she calls him like the nickname that annabeth says to him and she seems in that like in that dream that he has with her it seems like she knows who he is but mm -hmm. he doesn't know who she is and so it just makes you wonder if she's like floating around in some like weird conscious state where she like sees some of the things that's going on but doesn't I mean, know like, i can imagine annabeth sitting at her tree and talking to her like about these are the things that are happening right now at camp and like yeah what if she was actually hearing all of that mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really pretty. That'd be cool. I could see them even, depending on how they cast it and how they decide to do some of the, the flashback stuff, I could see them putting that in this season. Mm -hmm. And just, it makes me think of the line that Percy says on the show where he says, like, she met a pine cone, pine cone's fate. And I'm like, is that why she wakes up and doesn't like him? <laughs> no. She has other reasons not to like him that aren't rational but that's okay and but like it's yeah i just think about that like what is she because when she wakes up she doesn't know everything like i can't remember no i don't think it happens at the end of this book but there is at least somebody has to be the one to tell her like what happened with luke mm -hmm. when she wakes up like some by the point we start the third book somebody has already told her that but somebody had to tell her like she was literally like at camp being like, oh, where's Luke? And they had to be like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and tell her where he is. And so she doesn't know everything, but she's clearly aware. It makes sense in my head that she would be aware of Percy because of Annabeth, that Annabeth and Grover would probably come and talk to her okay. and tell her about this person that they're now best friends with that she didn't get to meet. And especially because he's another big three kid that seemingly is taking like the place that she had in this world. Um, it just makes me wonder about like how many people from camp tried to talk to her after she was gone or what. Yeah, because in the beginning we get a line when Percy asks about her where Annabelle says like, you remind me so much of her. Mm -hmm. So it is in this book too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I think it's in this book where Annabeth says to, per when he's talking, when she's talking to Percy about everything with like the prop, yeah, it's when they're talking about the prophecy stuff. And like, she's telling him about why the gods are afraid of him and stuff that they're saying that everyone thought that, that Chiron was sure that, um, that Thalia was going to be the prophecy kid, and the one that was going to do all these stuff, and then she died. And everyone, and so then everyone was just basically confused for like six years because they didn't know what was going to happen. And then suddenly he shows up and it's like, oh, okay. But yeah, for all yeah. those years, they generally had no idea what was going to, they just assumed that it was going to be her. And it, so when she died, it was like a total shock to everyone that she even did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So I'm trying to think if there's any other things I want to bring up from the Odyssey plot wise with like what happens in these two chapters. Um, the, the throwing rocks at the ship part, I do think so that was immediately after being blinded when Odysseus is yelling like, oh, yeah, it's me, Odysseus, son of Laertes. I'm the one who did this to you, if anyone asks. Um, he starts throwing boulders and was it Clarice that makes a, oh, your aim's gotten better, like joke or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a good thing to say when he's had decades to practice, you know? Yes. And it, let's like not try to antagonize the thing that's trying to kill all of you on purpose too much if we don't have to, but that's just the way that she does. It's so funny to hear like it's funny to have her, like, imagine her being there during, like, these fight scenes is funny in my head because of the ones that we have in the first book and, and the rest in this book is just, like, Annabeth and Percy or Annabeth and Percy and Grover. And they're all, like, very empathetic, you know, generally people. 
And so it's just funny having Cole Reese there being like, you're stupid <laughs> at like the Cyclops and like, why are you so stupid? And like making fun of him on purpose. And then at the end, when Tyson, when Tyson, when Percy doesn't want to kill him, she's like, what are you doing? Kill him already. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's, it's almost like she's like the voice of like the, the readers or something in, and just saying the things that nobody else out of this group of people would ever say, like nobody else would ever say anything like that. But mm -hmm. she's like a more nor quote unquote normal demigod. So of course she's going to start pulling that stuff out. Yeah, she's like the the person. If they were a D and D party, she's the one that's just off the rails that you can't control, and you're like, "Please don't get us into trouble again." We almost died last campaign. Yeah, and I liked even at the very end when Percy was like, "Okay, we're just gonna get on the ship," and 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 he she's like with Annabeth like this, <laughs> like she's like, "Can you just stop talking for three seconds and stop questioning every decision everyone makes and just kind of go with it for a couple seconds here?" <laughs> Like, yeah, please. I, I love that. that Percy calls himself on it too, though. That like he was getting really confident because he's he's now saved Annabeth from the water once, so he knows that he has some control over the water, and he kind of understands how to use it better. And now he's confident enough to not only take Annabeth with him, but Annabeth, Clarice, and Tyson all together. I mean, theoretically, I guess Tyson could take himself, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch that. I'm really so excited for the special effects. Mm -hmm. I That's what I think about when I'm reading these chapters of like imagining like, like, what is this stuff going to look like? Um, and then also to think about like the new character that they are introducing, like, is she going to be like, is she going to be around for any of this stuff? Like, is she going to be there when this stuff is going on? Is she going to be not there, but there's going to be other things that they'll be showing us going on with, like, Luke and his ship of horribleness or something at the same time? Is she going to be doing other things involved with that that they're going to show us? I, I, I just keep thinking, like, whatever she does in this season is going to somehow affect what the kids are doing. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes me wonder, like, what she could be doing that would possibly complicate things in a, in a way that is different from the books. Like, is she going to make it harder for Chiron to get there or something? Um, I don't know, because she's living in, like, the human world. So it makes me wonder if she's doing something in the human world that somehow affects what they're doing out there or something. Because there has to be, like, a, a reason for why they're doing stuff with her and it just makes me curious about like if she will be around somehow and making their life harder when they're doing these things yeah like if there's going to be a b plot because it is a good point it's been a few chapters since that princess andromeda chapter and mm -hmm. so we have no idea what luke has been up to this whole time we know generally that he knows the plan about the police he knows the location so um we're assuming that he's on the same path but mm -hmm. yeah like it, would, it would make sense that mm -hmm. she would be like that she would be like on this island and be like waiting for almost for them to be there or be like hiding when they are when they do arrive to try to like surprise them and kidnap them all all at the same time because like the way that these books go without like giving everything away for like the end because we're about to get there is that like they basically are trying to get back to camp and they have to separate because Luke is there mm -hmm. in like Miami and um, when they get back to land and and like Percy and Annabeth and Grover have to deal with Luke so that they so that Clarice can get like the golden fleece back to camp and hopefully like cure the tree and like make camp safe again before before Luke gets back there to try to stop them. And mm -hmm. so that's what goes on in the books, but it just adding in a character like that, you could easily have her find like that island and just be hiding out there and like be something, somebody else that they end up having to fight or whatever it could be, if they want to show her being somebody that is on Luke's side because she, because her, 
the thing with her character that makes me wonder about who her like godly parent is is that one character that everybody really likes in like the fandom at large is named like ethan nakamura and he doesn't show up until the fourth book um which is why i like the idea of this character being there sooner um to introduce this idea earlier on and like the the show is very focused about making everything that happens in the last book pay off and so it makes a lot of sense for them to introduce this idea earlier on but ethan is somebody who's um, godparent is Nemesis mm -hmm. and she t she like takes an eye from him and says that she's doing that as like a sacrifice because he's going to be like the reason why the like lower gods get like basically representation finally at camp and that is basically what happens like Percy listens to him and cares about him and understands when he is telling him about how I couldn't go to camp I have nowhere to stay when I'm at camp. So how am I, how am I supposed to go there? And like, what else do I have to do but to join Luke? Because I can't go to camp and I can't go anywhere else. So I have no choice but to join somebody like this, even if I wouldn't otherwise have joined him if you didn't force, if this was the only option that I had. And so it makes me wonder if somebody like her would be somebody like that, like one of the lower gods that ends up joining Kronos and stuff towards the end when you get to like the lower, the later books. Um, because they don't have cabins at camp until Percy makes them do it. <laughs> and, and so, um, and that she's somebody like that and wants to join Luke because she thinks that he'll help her get, be able to go to camp or her siblings be able to have a place like a camp or something when, even though she's too old now and, and can't go there, but then sees him doing this stuff, like even that sort of an angle, like, are you really going to show up? to an island with a bunch of like li literal seventh graders like se like a bunch of seventh graders and grover and clarice is is a little bit older but they're still pretty much young kids are you going to show up at, a, at an island with a bunch of young kids running around with their head cut off and just want to hurt them it's like a whole different thing to say that but it's a whole other thing to actually to actually do it and like luke can do it but just because he can does it mean that that anyone else would want to and it's just if they are going to do that whole thing of showing someone who is like indoctrinated basically by luke and then realizing like actually i don't i don't like this that would be like a good way of showing her doing it or just her being there at all and like bringing them to luke instead of instead of them going towards him because they have to to stop him yeah. and it's just those little changes you just that's like the fun of, I guess, this character is that because she's completely new, um, it's really, I think it's really rare in a series, obviously, because this is adapted from a book series, for us to have no idea what she's going to do. Like, we have no idea who she is. And so it's like really fun trying to spe like imagine where she would fit in into this story because she could do literally anything. Mm -hmm. Because there's, she's brand new, like there's nothing. There's like, this is a completely new person. And that just is exciting to imagine there's so many things that she could do yeah well it's funny like that we can have the discussions at this level because so many times people in fandom are just like no dogmatically go with the text or i'm not gonna watch it we ended on a cliffhanger we we have them leaving polyphemus's island next time um and yeah i can't remember how many more chapters there are after this i we'll see not that many yeah well, honestly i can't remember anything but like dissociation is making this like a new experience for me um yeah. but <laughs> but like i i don't think it's very many chapters after that because it's pretty much them leaving there and then running into luke again um and i mean we kind of get a uh wait the next chapter is called nobody gets the fleece yeah so we get a little we get a little uh, spoiler on how the quest ends up, at least the quest portion of what they're doing. Mm -hmm.